Welcome back to CS520. In this session, I want to talk about implementing mutexes and condition variables. This is building upon our thread implementation that we talked about earlier. I'm assuming some, a simple interface like this, again, roughly based upon POSIX threads. Right, I have initialization functions, um, and then mutexes, I can lock them. I can unlock them and condition variables. I can do weight, which again takes a condition variable and a mutex. The usual assumptions here that the caller has locked the mutex in advance. And then signal, which again takes a condition variable. So a very simple interface here. Let's think about mutexes. Um, what's the mutex object contain? Well, we need a flag that tells us whether the lock is locked, right? So when somebody calls lock, we need to look, is the, is the mutex already locked? If it's locked, we need to remember which thread locked it, because we're not going to allow a thread to, to unlock a, a lock it didn't lock, and we're not going to let a thread who already owns a lock try to lock it again. So we got to track ownership of the lock. And if it's locked, there might be uh, threads waiting, so we'll queue those. We'll put those in a queue waiting on the lock. So that's the basic state of the mutex. Let's write some pseudocode then to actually do the lock operation. So a, call, a thread calls lock. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to check to see if the lock is locked. If it's not locked, if it's available, then we'll set the flag to say it's locked, and we'll record the current thread's ID as the current owner of the, the lock. Otherwise, if the lock is already locked, then we'll check. Are we the owner? You know, is the caller already have the lock locked? If that's the case, then we're going to return a failure code. We're not going to allow uh, nested locking. Otherwise, we need to wait for this lock. So we remove the current threads TCB from the ready list. We're no, redder, we're no longer ready to run. We're going to block the thread. And that's what, what it means to block the thread, right? Remove it from the ready list. So we take the TCB off the ready list, and we put it onto the end of this lock's queue. It's going to have to wait. At that point, then, we call our ASM yield, right? We can no longer run, so we need to yield the processor to somebody else. When we wake up, right, when the lock becomes available to us again and someone yields to us, um, we set the flag to locked now. We, we can lock the lock now. And we set the owner to the current thread's ID. I guess that's, that's a bug, right? Um, Let me think about this for a minute. I go, no, I guess that's all right. When ASM yield, when we wake back up from that, we set the flag to locked, and we set the owner to be the current thread's ID. We've woken up, so we're the current thread at this point. We record that. And then exiting either the if or the then or the else clause, at this point, we're returning success. OK. That's, that all makes sense, I guess, is the question for you to think about. Um, the key things are right in here, right? If we have to wait for the lock, we, get, we pull ourselves off the ready list, we put ourselves on the end of a queue, and then we call the ASM yield to let somebody else run. That's how you do blocking, basically. When we wake back up, then we can, we're can we ready to grab the lock and uh, continue. So think about that, and then sit down and see if you can write the other half of this. Right? Can, given the code for lock, can you sit down and write pseudocode for unlock? It's a good exercise to make sure you understand what's going on here. OK, what about condition variables? Let's think about what information we need to record for a condition variable. Well, there's going to be a queue of threads waiting. right? When somebody waits, we put them in that queue. And when they call wait, they, they have a mutex associated with it. So we need to record, for each thread that's in the queue, we need to record what mutex it held when it called. Because when we signal it and wake it up, we need to have it reacquire that mutex. OK. 
Okay. So let's look at pseudocode for weight. We removed the current threads uh, TCB from the ready list. Um, all right, we're, we're doing a wait, so we're going to block. We remove our current thread from the threads TCB from the ready list. We place that TCB on the end of the condition variable's wait queue. We've got to remember to record the mutex. Again, the mutex would be a parameter to the wait primitive. We record the mutex in the queue entry. To do that, maybe we, we would add a field to the TCB for this purpose. If the TCBs are just going to be linked on these queues, like they're linked on the ready queue and presumably linked on the mutex queue that we just talked about. So we might just add a field to the TCB in order to, to handle that remembering of the mutex. Then we've got to unlock the mutex, right? Because before we block, we need to release the mutex. So we we call the unlock routine or maybe a helper function that does the the, the guts of the unlock. Um, by the way, we we do have an error check here that if if the T I'm sorry if the mutex that the caller passed to us is not locked by the caller, then we're going to fail out here. We're going to return failure out of the wait function. Of course, we'd have to really do that check before we pulled our TCB off the ready list. Um, so I'm being a little fuzzy here. Um, but once we've got our TCB in the wait queue and we've recorded the mutex and we've unlocked the mutex, then we can call ASMU to let somebody else run while we're blocked. When we wake up then, we lock the mutex and carry on. Okay. So again, same thing. S see if that makes sense and sit down and write the pseudocode. Write the pseudocode for um, signal. Good exercise to make sure you understand this stuff. All right, finally, I've, this discussion has been based upon assuming that we're implementing threads on a single processor. Um, but if we were building a threads library with mutexes and condition variables that we're going to run on multiple processors, then we would we would use the compare and exchange instruction to do a low-level lock on these lock and condition variable objects so that we know we had exclusive control of these objects before we started working on them. And again, I actually mentioned that um, in the discussion of compare and exchange earlier in the course. So you want to make they want to go back and look at those slides. Uh, but that's how you would do this. You would use compare and exchange to do a low-level lock now, just to make sure you have exclusive control of these lock and condition variables, these higher-level concepts, that you have exclusive control of the objects that are implementing those higher-level concepts before you start working upon them. Because in your multiple processor environment, people could be banging on those, you know, could be trying to access, access those objects at the same time with all the usual problems that that can cause. But compare and exchange can allow us to uh, implement a very low-level locking scheme. All right, that's a quick view of how to, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got an implementation of threads, how you can graph mutexes and condition variables on top of them.